We are continuing with the Mundak Upanishad. The last session I introduced the Upanishad to you and we did the first six verses of the Upanishad. One of the finest Upanishads and an important Upanishad from our tradition. We will come to verse 7 of chapter 1, canto 1. And this is a very important verse. This gives us a clue to why this Upanishad is called the Mundak Upanishad and what is the meaning in the sense uh, Mundak, as you already know, means shaven head. And as you know, renunciates in India are expected to shave their heads. And why is this so? We will understand this in this verse. I'm reading verse 7. Just as a spider releases and reels in its web, just as the herbs, all trees and plants, emerge from the earth, or just as the hair grows out of the human body, so does the universe emerge from and become reabsorbed into the indestructible absolute truth. This one verse with very beautiful examples, very pictorial, vivid imagery, explains in a nutshell all of life. This is how life as we know it emerges from pure consciousness, manifests from the finer, from the subtler to the grosser, and at some point returns back to that seed. If it were a plant, you see it comes from a seed, it germinates, there are little stem branches, leaves and someday, sometime that entire plant goes back, it returns to the earth. So what is it that <clears throat> is just like that? How is it that our life is just like this? To understand that, we can Take a look at this diagram. Most of you will recognize this diagram. It's a very famous diagram. Oh, only difference is that it's maybe seems like it's kind of not the right side up. It's sideways. It's deliberately sideways. Everybody can see it, I hope. May be a little bit difficult to read, you will have to kind of <laughs> turn your, your head a bit to the side to read it. The diagram is the same. We have center of consciousness, from that emerges prana. From prana, you have the finer or the subtler mind, the unconscious mind, and the, and the conscious mind which becomes a little bit more gross in the form of breath, finally grosser still in the form of the body and senses ultimately we come to the gross level of the world here, all the objects of the world, worldly objects, sensory objects. Now, if you look at this carefully, imagine that this is the seed. This is the stem or the, the trunk of the tree here and these are it manifests in the form of branches and these are the leaves here 
right? So what do we have? Have the tree of life. This is how you look. You yourself are the tree of life. We can take the example as given in the book. It is like a spider that here, which, which puts out its web here and then withdraws it and goes back eventually to the center of consciousness. Or if we take the other example that was mentioned of the hair in the human body, and it's like hair that grows out of the body. And what does then the renunciate want to say to the world when he shaves his head? What is the message that he is sending out to the, to the world? He is, or she is, putting out the message here. I cut this off from here. The hair cannot grow out from the roots anymore. I cut it here. No hair, absolutely none. And I want to remain established in the center of consciousness. This is what a sannyasi, a renunciate, is proclaiming to the world. And that is to remind him of all the time that that is his goal. And this Upanishad is therefore called Mundak, shaven head, because understanding and integrating the wisdom and the knowledge from this Upanishad will make a renunciate of you. It doesn't mean Tiaga in the sense of Tiaga, renunciate, but one who has no more attachments to the world. It's cut here. You are no longer attached to the content of your mind. You don't identify with it. You do not identify with the thoughts of your conscious mind, your identities or Ahankara. You do not identify with your body or the senses as well as the worldly objects. You become a paramvairagi. You remain established here in the center of consciousness. And that is why this Upanishad is known as the Mundak Upanishad. Beautiful symbolism and if one contemplates on it, it will really work its magic on you. So if you see what it's doing, this here, this path here going outwards is Pravritti Marg and what renunciate or one who aspires to attain Vairagya wants to do is to cut this here and remain here, established here in Nivritti Marg. So basically returning back to the source. Any questions, thoughts, comments about this particular verse, this diagram? somehow imply when you talk about a shaven head that um, this is directed only towards monks? One could get that impression. No, no, no. As I said, renunciate uh, does not imply a monk in that sense. Um, if we, as we continue the story, we will see that the dialogue is between Angiras and Shavnak. I mentioned in the last session that Shavnak is the perfect householder. So you see, this wisdom 
is for both, for the monk as well as the perfect householder. It is not a privilege only of monks. Monks are those who do tiaga. They renounce the worldly objects, but it does not mean that they have actually renounced internally. They have physically renounced the objects, but they may still be attached to them internally, mentally. And what is real, true, deep renunciation is an internal process. It's very easy to physically give up objects. You know, it's pretty easy. It may be uh, experience that you may experience some difficulties mentally with, with the renunciation of those objects, but you can renounce uh, physically these objects. But to actually internally renounce them so that they lose their hold over you, that's the tough part. So while we do have a certain respect for those who perform tiaga and become monks, that is in a sense the lower path. We say that the higher path is the true internal renunciation. What happens when you internally renounce internally? You don't become a, a swami or a, a sannyasi. You actually <clears throat> become a wise person, a sage. The sages who wrote all the Upanishads, all of them were householders. In fact, this is one of the rare Upanishads where one of the teachers is a monk. <clears throat> In most of the Upanishads, the teachers were householders, kings, women, as well, wives. You know, the wives were, were mothers, were teaching. There were different teachers taking different forms. So there is absolutely no such uh, limitation. You do not have to renounce physically. You do not have to become a monk in order to attain the state of Vairagya. Okay, thanks. It, in, in fact, it might just happen that sometimes that Vairagya, uh, sorry, uh, Tiaga, renunciation, physical renunciation may become an obstacle. That is that does happen. Okay, so we go back to the verses. Verses eight and nine I will read together because they are the last two verses of this chapter. Brahman manifests through tapas knowledge. From that he was annam the essence of nourishment. From that evolves prana, life force, the mind and the five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air and space, the law of karma and the inevitable fruit of karma, which cannot be avoided. From him, absolute truth, which includes all knowledge and omniscience, and whose discipline and practice are made up of knowledge, comes the eminent form of Brahman, Hiranyagarbha, and the principles of name, color, and substance. <clears throat> These two verses are describing, once again, in great detail, the tattvas, the process of the outward moving, the pravritti mark, the movement from the subtle to the gross, and how it returns back once again. So, going back to the diagram, we see here the reference is coming the evolution from the seed here through. Prana 
to the mind the, the elements are mentioned the five elements which is what this is all made up of starting from the subtle most space air fire water coming to earth and leading ultimately to karma here action from the body when you have a body there is going to be karma and the fruit of the karma which is here in the world so this verse has explained the outward moving path or pravritti mark and then returning back to this essence which gives us all knowledge omniscience and when you know your essence when you know the drop you know everything so if you know the individual soul you know the universal soul bringing us to that knowledge of microcosm and as well as macrocosm knowing yourself means you know everything coming back to the question original question asked by shavnak what is it knowing which you know all knowing that a sense of yourself knowing that you know all and this is explained very clearly in these two verses the entire process going from going outward and back returning inward and to do that to go back inward you need discipline and practice we have been through this diagram many times and i know it's a repetition it is probably the only thing you really need to know there are a lot of people who think that they need to read lots and lots of complicated books and take a lot of courses and do a lot of online programs and attend all sorts of meetings and and read look at lots of websites and watch lots of video but i'm one of the few who's of the opinion that you actually do not need much knowledge in terms of information what you need is integration of that little knowledge and the little knowledge you need is basically if i would put it in one page then i would take this one page and say this is all you really need to know more than that you don't need to know this would be what i would take along to the <laughs> deserted island you know they ask you what is it that you would take along to a deserted island if you had 10 things to take along so it makes you think about the really important things in your life of course most people say i would take my spouse and my children and all this and i say yeah that's great but it's this is a very useful little page to carry along because this is really the wisdom of life and death and that is why we are really here that's a real dharma to to know this understand this integrate this and let these mysteries then eventually reveal themselves any questions thoughts comments Okay, in that case, we continue to chapter one, canto two, and I will read verses one to seven. 
since they are related. The ritualistic ceremonies which were revealed to the seers were described in many ways in the three Vedas, Rig, Yajur and Samaveda, those being desirous to attain their meritorious results practice them. This is your path leading towards virtuous ends. When the fire is ablaze, an aspirant should offer the oblations systematically, one by one in the prescribed manner. If the aspirant's Agnihotra ceremony is not performed in the right manner, without regard to the new and full moons, the four months of the rainy season, the summer sostars, the presence of guests, the Vaisvadeva ceremony, or if not performed in the prescribed manner, then it destroys the intended goal, which may stretch across all his seven worlds. These are the names of the seven towns of fire, Kali, Karali, Manojava, Sulohita, Sudhumra Varna, Shpulingini, and Vishwaruchi. These seven flickering flames create the seven tongues of the fire. The light of the sun's rays lead an aspirant who performs this offering into the fire at the right time to realize the sole sovereign of all bright beings. The luminous obligations, oblations say to the performer, come hither, come higher, and lead him through the rays of the sun, honoring him and greeting him delightfully and pleasantly. This is the holy heaven of Brahma, attained by your virtuous works. Composed of 18 constituents, the five elements, the ten senses, mind, ego and intellect. This raft of life, which serves as a ground for performing the sacrifices, is not itself anchored securely and thus remains adrift. These verses are related and therefore I read them together. This is referring to ritual ceremonies or sacrifices, also known as yajnas. Yajnas or yagyas, as they are sometimes called, are were very popular during yogic, uh, sorry, Vedic times and in the Brahmanical communities, even today, they are performed. We commonly know of marriage rituals, rituals related to birth, death. These are very common. There are certain other rituals that are not so common. What are rituals, actually? The first three Vedas, the Rig, Yajur and Samaveda, are a collection of mostly of rituals, chants, mantras, and the fourth Veda, the Athar Veda, is slightly different. The Upanishads that we have been work, we have been reading from, the Mundak as well as the Mandukya, are from the fourth Veda, which is the Atharva Veda. First three are ritualistic, but the fourth one relates to Ayurveda relates to healing, relates to mysticism, relates to mysterious um, comments or chants, or incantations about somaras. It's a very fascinating collection of yogic literature, the fourth Veda, Athar Veda. The word Atharva Veda comes from Atharvan. Atharvan was a fire priest, priest of fire. He took care of the fire. 
So the Atal Veda is the knowledge of the fire. Or the knowledge of the fire priest. What, who is a fire priest? Is it just a person performing mechanically ceremonies? It may seem like that. And it is true that many through, who have come from the Brahminical lineage, that's how they perform these rituals. They're very mechanical. And they do not know the deeper meaning behind these rituals. These rituals are generally representations of the reality. It is an attempt to capture the reality and to replay it or enact it and then internalize it. So here we are talking about the fire ritual. What is the fire ritual? Is it just about lighting a fire and putting in some offerings of ghee and rice and flowers or whatever. The ritual that is being referred to is the internal fire. The offering is made to the bowl of fire at the base of the spine. And what is offered here? Who's participating in this ritual? In the Agnihotra ceremony, the fire ceremony, ceremony, there are 18 constituents. These are, in fact, representing the five elements that I mentioned earlier. Earth, water, fire, air and space. The ten senses, five active, five cognitive. Manas, Ahankara, and Buddhi, what is translated here as mind, ego, and intellect. These are the 18 constituents, the raft of life. That's what you are made up of. And this is actually the ground for performing the ceremonies, your body itself. The five tongues of fire, these are the five chakras. Imagine that the, the word chakra means wheel. Imagine that this wheel, the turning of the wheel is giving you energy. It's prana, actually. It's energy. It's visualized as a kind of a fire here. So we refer to them as seven tongues of fire. And when you perform this internal ceremony, it is going through each of the chakras, leading you from the sun, the light of the sun's ray. The sun is visualized as the solar chakra, which is the Manipura chakra. That's called the solar plexus. Even in English, it's known as the solar plexus. It's the most powerful chakra and dominates your physical body. So when you are offering into this fire, the sun's rays will lead you higher, taking up to the higher chakras, the subtler chakras. This is performance of an internal ceremony. This is nothing under other than Kundalini awakening going through all the chakras to the top. In the ritual ceremony, we try to enact this out. We try to internalize it in a, in a way in the external, you know, so that one, we say that when something manifests in the external world, then it, it sort of really happens. It's like with children. You know, they, when they're learning alphabets, these are very abstract for them. So to help them learn initially, 
in some play schools, they help them write the alphabet in, in sand so they can feel it. You know, the, the fingers feel the alphabet. And when they feel the alphabet, it gets impressed in the mind. So in fact, the external ritual is meant to be internalized deeper so that eventually it does happen, that, that re happens in reality. It's no longer just an inaction of the reality, but it becomes reality. And that is why rituals are performed. If they were performed with this awareness, with this understanding, with the understanding that this is only external representation of what really must happen internally, then they do serve a purpose. They can be useful. But mostly... What happens is these rituals are purely mechanical. People do not understand them. They just perform them and the entire thing is totally commercialized. These rituals are throughout the world in all the traditions of the world, whether it's Islam, it's Christianity, it's Buddhism, anything. All the rituals are representations of internal reality. <clears throat> so, question from Sri Ram, is there any reason why these scriptures are written in such a cryptic form and is subjected to potential misinterpretation? Why was it not written in a direct way? Well, this, these were written, some of them like 3,000, 4,000 years ago written in a different Sanskrit than is used today. It's not classical Sanskrit, it was written in Vedic Sanskrit. Most people don't even understand this. It's very difficult to understand. So when the first Western translators started working on this, it started with uh, Max Muller and um, some British translators, and Paul Dusen, also German, Max Muller, also German, most of these people, first of all, never came to India and they were like really living in an ivory tower there in Cambridge University or wherever and were translating these things. They were not part of a lineage. So one was a language problem. Second was they were not a part of a lineage. So they could not have possibly understood this. They were not meditators. They were scholars. For people of that time, those who were meditating, this was not cryptic. This was pretty clear. And these texts were only shared with those who, who were part of that lineage. This text is something like, today you would say there's a medical textbook. I could say... Shriram, that why these people write these complicated medical textbooks in such a cryptic manner? I, I don't understand this. Or there are some law books or engineering books. And I say, why don't they write in a very simple manner so that I can understand it? Well, every field has its technical words, jargon, language. And those who know the language, they are in it, they understand it. Could say the same in computers, they have their own technical terminology. So here, there are certain terms that are used. And this actually helps us to understand. Initially, it is difficult, you have to learn the, the language. But once you learn it, it gets better. The main reason that we do not understand these things today, they seem cryptic, is that life as it used to be does not exist anymore. The Vedic times have passed. 
the Vedic lifestyle has disappeared. We cannot relate to that lifestyle. We are not grown up with these ideals. We have not grown up with these disciplines. They were taught these from childhood. They didn't find this cryptic. So it is cryptic because today our life is very divorced from nature. It is very divorced from our own selves. We don't know our own bodies. We don't know simple things about how to take care of ourselves. Simple things about diet or simple things about how to be healthy. We don't know these things. And so we cannot relate to these texts. It is true that they are being misinterpreted, and they are being misinterpreted by those people who are not part of a lineage where they are then um, accompanied with appropriate practices. The reality is that when you see the written word, a text, a book, it will always be misinterpreted. And it will always be misinterpreted because of manas, because of ahankara, because of the way the senses operate. If you do not have sharp buddhi, you will not be able to interpret. And that is why you need a teacher. A teacher who has also been trained in a lineage or a teacher who has a sharp buddhi, who has, a, has sharpened his buddhi to an extent that he doesn't need another external guide, but he, has, he himself is in touch with the internal guru. So you need a teacher to interpret, to explain these things to you. I hope that was a satisfactory explanation. We come to verses 8 to 10. 8, 9, 10 is other verses that I will read together. Once again, they are related. So I block them together. Fools are caught in the snare of ignorance, yet consider themselves to be wise. Caught in the unending cycle of pain and misery, they lead their lives as the blind are led by the blind. Like children, fools remain in, caught in the snare of ignorance, yet think that they have attained the highest goal of life. Due to attachment, they do not understand the essence of karma. Therefore, after exhausting the fruits of their virtuous deeds, they fall back into the cycle of birth and death. Considering religious activities and mere public charity projects to be supreme, ignorant people do not recognize the highest good. Having enjoyed the fruits of their virtuous deeds in heaven, they return to the lower planes of existence. We said that the yogic or Vedic life is renewed. It is, does not exist anymore. All those values are, are not there. And we have not been raised with that kind of Vedic discipline, Vedic lifestyle. The focus, the emphasis is very much material. So we remain caught up in our desires of chasing a job, a career, wanting to, you know, uh, enjoy which is not itself wrong I mean you can enjoy uh, relationships 
but not get attached to them. So, but we do get attached to them and we think that that attachment is everything. So we get caught up in these uh, unhealthy relationships and we chase material objects, cars, houses, wealth, careers, jobs, promotions, titles, degrees, all these. And while we are caught up in this ignorance from a yogic perspective, ignorance, such people consider themselves to be very clever. They think they're great, they're wonderful. They think they've achieved something great when they get, get a degree of some sort. And they're very proud if they get a title of some sort. And they are going up and down through the highs and lows of uh, excitement, happiness, or pleasures, and then suddenly there's pain, there's suffering, there's misery, and so you keep going up and down, you keep this unending cycle. And you lead your life as if you're blind and you're being led by the blind. It's very often the case that you are blind because you do not understand where all this is leading. You don't have the overview, the big perspective. If you are at the bottom of the mountain trying to make your way up, you're struggling. All the ways there's, you know, there's shrubs and bushes everywhere and there's stones and there other obstacles and it's tiring, exhausting, you get lost. But if you are at the top of the mountain, you have an overview, then you, you can see everything. And to the, to the person at the bottom of the mountain, he thinks, hey, how did that chap know all this? You know, how is he able to guide me from top? Because he can see that you, down, you are blind. Now, if your teacher is also down there with you, <laughs> then it's the case of the blind leading the blind. And so there are many such teachers who are themselves blind because they have not reached that summit. They have just read books and they're good at uh, parroting things out of books. But they're not very good at guiding people really through the, uh, the difficulties or the treacherous paths of life because they actually haven't experienced that. It's all theoretical. And then you get stuck in this unending cycle. You know, children, here it talks about fools. Well, there are two kinds of fools, you know. One is a fool which is like a child. A child is not a fool, you know, it's just innocent. It needs to develop, it needs to mature and become grown up, it needs to go through its experiences, learn. When these children become teenagers, then they're real fools because they think they know everything. And so that's the second kind of fool. The second kind of fool is those who consider them to be themselves to be wise. They think they know everything, they think they're very clever because they have got great degrees and they have got great careers and great cars. And so this is the second kind of a fool. The first kind is like a child. There's scope for development. You can help that person. But the second kind you cannot help because they think they already know. And so for them, it's a very, very difficult way because it's a case of the blind leading the blind. They think they already know, so they have to go through a lot more suffering till they admit that they do not know that they themselves need help and they look for guidance. So those who are like children they are attached, like children get attached to their toys and get attached to the little sand castle. 
knows that when the wave comes, the sand castle is going to get washed away, but still gets att is very attached to the sand castle. It makes a, a little figure in the sand, in the sand box, and knows that very soon the, he has to go home, and next morning when he comes back to play, some other kid will have stamped his uh, little sand figure there, but he still is very attached to it, that he can grow. So that is an attachment that is something that we have to learn. This is the highest goal, to understand the essence of karma, to do your duties, perform them, but do not get attached. Enjoy all the, the things that life offers to you, like you go to a hotel or a resort for a holiday, you enjoy the resort, you enjoy all the facilities of the hotel, but you don't get attached and begin to, to think or imagine that this hotel belongs to you. No, it's just a hotel and you're a guest and you know that your stay is only for a couple of days. So, is it... It is with this life, we are like guests here, we should enjoy it, but not get attached to these things. If you do not take heed, you perform your, your duties with a sense of attachment, what will happen is, you will get the fruits of this and eventually experience this also at death which is basically the samskaras. They lead you to an experience which can be termed as heaven or hell. In reality, this is nothing other than samskaras that you're experiencing. It's like going to bed at night. You have good dreams or you have bad dreams. And imagine now you don't have a body and you would be then in heaven and hell, depending on what kind of things go through your mind, which is now bodiless. It's not embodied anymore, it's a dim disembodied. And if you have got a lot of attachment, you will have a lot of dreams, you will suffer, even in your dreams, and after a certain period of time, you come back. So these internal worlds, or the seven tongues, are also internal worlds. They are different planes of consciousness. If you're stuck at the first chakra level, that's a plane of existence which is related to fear, which is related to attachment to worldly things. So similarly, each chakra has its characteristics. So you come to the higher chakras, there is more light, more love, more joy, more... more. These, that's where we would want to be. That's where we aspire to be. Merely participating in ritual activities, religious activities or public charity projects you know, good works, as we say, uh, virtuous works, they are fine, they're good. But this is not the highest good. A person who is practicing these religious activities and charitable projects are considered to be ignorant. This may come as a shock to some of us here. It says so here, I did not say it myself, I did not make this up. It says so here very clearly. This is also part of ignorance. Because it's not the highest good. This is still part of our worldly existence. This is still heaven, hell. This is all part of duality. So even one who is engaging in religious and charitable deeds 
will return to the lower planes of existence, to the lower chakras. Any questions regarding verses 8, 9 and 10? Okay, maybe some of you are just shell-shocked uh, that even good deeds are considered to be part of ignorance. Just to help you with that, Yoga Sutras explain that karma is divided into four kinds. Good karma or white karma, black karma, which is definitely very evil. There's mixed karma, which is black and white. So it may be that you make a donation, but you do it because you want your name to be announced somewhere. So you can tell everybody, look what a good person I am. That would be an example of mixed karma. And then there is karma that is not white, not black. That's the fourth kind. And only this fourth kind of karma leads to the highest chakras. Deep meditation in dhyana, you are creating impressions that are not black, not white. And only these lead to the highest good. The other three kinds are part of duality and they do not lead you to anything higher. It may just be that by doing white karma you don't make things worse. But other than that, this all remains a part of the world. Remember the first six chakras are all a part of the world. Uh, the first five chakras are part of the world. The sixth one is the gateway to, to the higher chakras. And it's guardian of the higher chakras. So, since there are no comments, I'll continue to verses, reading verses 11, 12 and 13. Living in solitude, content with the food they receive as arms, observing the discipline of tapas and having firm faith, the wise with serene and purified minds enter to the gate of the sun, the realm wherein dwells that immortal, unchanging, eternal Purusha, the Supreme Self. After examining the objects of the world that one has gained, through one's karma, the knower of Brahman reaches a state of dispassion and non-attachment and realizes that the highest cannot be attained through mere actions. In order to know that, the aspirant should present himself with all his humility to a guru who is learned and established in Brahman consciousness. That learned teacher imparts the sense of Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman, to the student who has approached him with reverence, whose mind is calm and tranquil, and who has achieved self discipline. Such a student recognizes the eternal Purusha, pure consciousness, and truth. So while the preceding three verses explained to us what ignorance was about evil, the next three verses explain the path, the way out of this. 
So the wise have a way out of this misery, out of this evil. They enter to the gate of the sun, symbolic sun and moon, two parts, yeah. Ida and Pingala, means conscious mind or unconscious mind. Gate of the sun is the conscious approach, not the unconscious approach. So consciously go to the realm of the unchanging, immortal, eternal Purusha. And they achieve this by living in solitude, content with little food, simple food, observing tapas, discipline, and having faith, trust. It's not blind faith, but it is deep trust from within, knowing, simply knowing that this is the right thing to do. Their minds are quiet and purified. They take that conscious path within. So the one who knows the Brahman becomes detached and non-attached and only such a person understands the highest truth. So if you are an aspirant and if you too want to attain that state of wisdom, then present yourself with humility to a teacher who has seen who is a seer, who has seen. It doesn't help to be in service of a guru who himself is nearly got book knowledge. That, as I mentioned, would be the case of the blind leading the blind. But with the right approach, present yourself to one who has seen with humility and that is very often what is lacking in the modern student. Because the modern student is so puffed up with his degrees and with his achievements in the material world that the modern student has forgotten about reverence and respect. We think, they think they're so clever because they've read a lot of books and they have forgotten simple things like how to approach a teacher. And having approached the teacher in the right way, if you find, the teacher finds you to be worthy. You would be worthy if you have a certain respect for the teacher. If the calm is tranquil, mind is tranquil. And if you're more or less disciplined, if you have these qualities, then you also have a discrimination to be able to recognize the truth. And to such a student, the teacher imparts the essence of Brahma Vidya. That's the highest knowledge. Here, Brahma Vidya does not mean the intellectual study of something like the Brahma Sutras or uh, Shiva Sutras or Yoga Sutras or all these uh, texts. This can become an intellectual study. But that's not what is meant here. It is a living tradition. And if you approach a teacher of a living tradition who has seen, such a teacher would guide you in quite a different manner from a teacher who has not seen. A teacher who has not seen, who is only reading books, will also encourage you to read books and tell you, you know, read all these books and then you, you can teach. And you also become a teacher, having read a few books, done a few courses. But you will not have changed your personality, your character. And this can be done only by a teacher who himself has unlearned, purified himself by unlearning deep-rooted habit patterns. Habit patterns, by which I mean thinking patterns, behavior patterns, 
which are negative, harmful. And when you unlearn these, you purify yourself. So that beauty, the treasure which is within you, that's not gone anywhere. It's still there, but it's just covered up with all these many, many habit patterns. But when these habit patterns are all removed, cut away, drop, they drop away, then the light within shines forth. And that is pure consciousness. So what you need guidance in is interpretation of these texts, working with a teacher who helps you to cut away all these habit patterns, helps you to unlearn. It's very easy to learn. You will find lots of teachers who will teach you how to learn all the different texts, but you will not find, you will find it, they're very rare teachers who will help you unlearn. They're not very popular, <laughs> these kind of teachers, but the worthy student will find them. Any comments? Any questions? No, in that case, if everybody is happy, then we end our session at this point. We'll continue then next uh, week, same time. Have a nice weekend, everyone.